welcome back to our course. I'm your host, your teacher, your rabbi, Reverend Patrick Maridai. We are in claim that the Christian Leadership Institute of Minnesota and beyond the Tengela branch. Our today course is on church planting. After learning all about evangelism and world missions, now we get to church planting. And I would like us to go straight to our course introduction. And in the course introduction, we are going to start by looking at the importance of church planting. Church planting is that aspect where you are gone you have preached the gospel, you have gone on a mission, you have preached the gospel, people have received Christ, or they have become born again. So now, there is another aspect there. In the Great Commission, Jesus said, go ye to all the world, that is Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, and preach this good news to all the creation, all the people. And them who will believe, baptizing them, and behold teaching them. And now, when we come to church planting, is that point where we have to settle them and teach them so that we may set them again. So the importance of church planting. Number one, the gospel of evangelism is to add to the church. Our goals must focus on improving the appearance of the bride. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27 we are talking of the bride the, which is the church the church is the is the bride the church is the bride so we are talking about increasing the church we are talking about expansion we are talking about filling the church we are talking about bringing people to the church, the, we go out to the unchurched and we preach the gospel of the kingdom to them and they come to the church because they feel that they want to come here. This is where they begin, they belong. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27, Paul said that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So this is the church that Christ ought to present, that ought to be presented, the people that ought to be presented to Christ when he comes are the people who are without blemish. And all this happens in the church. The church is the foundational unit of Christianity. It is the body of its founder and leader. So the church is the foundation because therefore, to plant a church is to plant Christianity. If the church is a foundational unit of Christianity, then to plant a church is to plant Christianity. To plant a church is to plant an expression of Christ. It is in the church where people will see and they will recognize the church. Remember the first disciples at Antioch, they went in at Antioch, what was happening there, and the Bible says that Christians were first called, they were first called Christians at Antioch because of how they presented, they expressed Christ. What is the purpose of the of this course? In this course, we hope to gain a foundational understanding of church planting. This course gives the student vision, ideas, and tools for church planting use. We will study various church planting issues in the first part of the course. In the second part of the course, we will gain from the experience of George Patterson, who has planted hundreds of churches in Honduras. This course will offer a summary of the information found in his book called A Church Planting Guide. In that study, we will consider what Patterson calls the 12 church planting activities. So let us begin by considering some teaching that are based on the experience of another counseling, another successful church planter, Tari Tomezak. So we begin by his experience, the church planting experience of Tom Pandarak, and 
This takes us to our second uh, part two of the church course, that is church planting and the Bible. What does the Bible say about church planting? Does the Bible have any basics in lieu or concerning church planting? So if you want to have New Testament church results, then you need to return to the New Testament plans of church planting according to the book of Acts chapter number 2 verses 41 and the acts of apostles are what the apostles of Jesus Christ were doing or did after, immediately after Christ had ascended in essence it is what we are supposed to follow, we are supposed to emulate as Paul followed and he said follow me as I follow Christ here is the admonition in Acts chapter 1 in Acts chapter 2 verses 41 and the Bible says then they who gladly received this word were baptized and the same day there were added they were added unto them about 3,000 souls so we need to return to the New Testament plan of church planting whereby they went out, they preached the gospel, people were baptized, and after being baptized, they were brought to the church, and the church was added. So church planting is like an addition to the church. There are many methods of evangelism. However, in the New Testament, the method of planting a church was used most often for evangelism. People used to go out for evangelism, and then they planted a church there to complete the Great Commission, which means to make disciples, not simply getting people to make decisions to become Christians, we must plant churches. So to complete the Great Commission, which means to make disciples, Great Commission means making disciples, and not simply getting people to make decisions, but to become Christians. We must plant churches where they will be settled, where they will be nurtured, where they will be mature. We must, we must focus on multiplication, there must be spiritual multiplication in the lives of these people. This means that producing high quality fruit will eventually result in the production of a large quantity of fruit. The philosophy of multiplication seeks to evangelize and disciples a small group of people in order to affect a wider area. So we go there, you, you evangelize to a small group of people, then they are trained or taught and they are sent back to go now to reach a greater wide area of people. The principles of multiplication begins in Genesis with Adam and Eve. They were commanded to multiply in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. They were not told to add but to multiply. They did not populate the whole earth themselves. They reproduced themselves. Their children then reproduced themselves and etc. etc. That began from the beginning, the beginning of the gospel, the beginning in, in the Garden of Eden, or in the world when Jesus, when God created the world. So we have seen that it did not happen like this. This is addition. Adam did not just add himself. Adam and Eve did not just add himself. It did happen like the multiplication whereby Adam and Eve, they reproduce children, where we have Abel, we have Cain, we have Seth, we have others who also reproduce themselves and then there was a great multiplication in the face of the earth from one person that God created Adam and then he created Eve and out of them now we talk of the world expansion where there is the multiplication of people on the face of earth, there is the different languages and people and races. The application of this principle is essential in church planting. We do not want to create dependency. We want to multiply or reproduce those who will do the same thing, reproduce others as Timothy admonished us, as Paul admonished Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2, he told him
Second Timothy chapter two and verse two. And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit you to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So here, Paul was admonishing Timothy that whatever he has heard, whatever he has seen from, Tom, from, from Paul, whatever he has seen Paul doing, he should also do the same to people. And it is regardless of whether they are great or great number of people or just an individual, one person, what you're supposed to do is that you reproduce what you have, reproduce to others, and to commit to faithful people who can do the same, who can reproduce, or who can commit the same things to other people. We need to plant local churches that break the life of the New Testament church. The message, it must be strong and direct with a clear challenge to repent and believe. So when we present the gospel, the gospel has to challenge the people to be convicted of their sins and to come to Christ to repent and to believe. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 39, this is what we are seeing as an example. Acts 2, 36 to 39. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. These are the disciples of Jesus when they were presenting the gospel, they were preaching, they were evangelizing, and they were telling the people that the same gospel, the same Jesus that they crucified has resurrected. And they are preaching the same person. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said that to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said that to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So the gospel, <coughs> or the message must be strong and direct with a clear challenge to repent and believe. Let them ask themselves after hearing the gospel, what shall we do or what must we do? The mentality or perspective for church planting. The world is not simply a destruction. It is understood that the life of the world is ex expressively or and it is aggressively against the life of, of the Christian. Therefore, although we cannot be isolated from the world, we must be separated from the world. Once we get born again, we are not separate, we are not we are not taken away from the world, but we need to be in the world but be separated. What is the method of organization? Each Christian must be a vital part of the local church. Each member of the body must function in the body. All of us who are calling ourselves Christians, we must belong to a body, we must belong to a church. The church is an organization where we are all part of it and we have different function. Each Christian must be a vital part of the local church and each member of the body must function in the body. The way we have this, our physical body, we have the eyes, we have the mouth, we have the ears, we have the legs, we have the eyes, the hands, and each part functions differently, but to the same function or to the working of this body. Christianity does not only consist of meetings. It is a shared life within the community of faith. The structure and organization of the church is not based on meetings and programs. It is based on relationships. So the moment we receive Jesus Christ, He becomes Lord and Savior of our, of our lives, we make relationships with other Christians. We are not isolated. We are not island. We become part of each other and we build a relationship where we relate one to another. And that's why we, we are called brethren. God is not concerned with how fast we can build the church. 
It is concerned with the quality of the work. It is not how fast. It is not how fast we can build the church. Many of the times we have heard people saying that that is a small church. That's a very small church. They are just in a small building. It is not about the building. It is about the relationship and the work that God is given us. It is not about the physical construction. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10. This is the letter to the Corinthian church from Paul. And he said, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereof, thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. So Paul said that he had laid the foundations, and out of this foundation that he has laid, it is not a master that he completes it. But in upon the foundation that he has made, he said that let somebody else come and build upon it, but don't build on any other foundation and don't lay any other different foundation from but the foundation that has been brought. And he continued to say that for other foundations can no, can no man lay that this that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, Hey, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work for what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So Paul is telling us here that there is a foundation that has been laid, and we need to lay upon the, there is a foundation that has been laid. So any building that we build must be upon that foundation. And he's saying that the master builder, him being a master builder, and he has made the foundation from Jesus Christ, he's saying that we should not have any other gospel apart from this one. And that any foundation that we lay, whatever we put on that foundation, whether wood or grass, whether gold or silver, he's saying that it will have to pass through trial. That is, it will come or it will go through the fire to try and to test it. And he said that, Whatever it is, whatever will come out of it after the work, that is what will remain of you. If your foundation, if your building will not be burned down, you will be saved both you and your building. But if it will be burned down, then you are in for it. The church is planted by an apostolic team. Every time the church is planted by an apostolic team, a team. and that's why you hear Paul every time calling himself, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. The works of the apostles is to establish, is to go out there and do the work, and then they prepare people and give the work to them so that they may continue to what he had told them. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 is when we are given different gifts. The gifts that are given there, we know the gifts. The Bible says that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, evangelists and some pastors and teachers. In the First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight. First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight. Paul. He's also giving us the same thing that he said, and God has sent some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, gifts of helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And then he asked a question, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers and miracles, are all, do they all have all the same gifts of healing? 
Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But now, how comes that today in the world we all want to be called apostles? We all want to be called different names. We all want to be called miracle workers. We all want to be called prophets. What is happening in the world today? What is the problem with mankind? What is the problem with Christianity? Paul worked with a team, Acts chapter 13, verse 2 and 5 and 13, and Acts chapter 20, verse 34, Acts chapter 22, verse 6. Paul worked with a team. He didn't work alone. We will say more about apostolic teams later in the course, but we need to see that the, it all begins or it all works well in a team. It all works well when we have the structure, when we have the organization. So there is a there is a diagram to summarize a, a, a correct view of the church. And in this diagram, in one point there is the Christianity, then a meeting and a shared love, life. So in the Christianity, we have the structure of the church, which is based on meetings and programs, and is based on true relationship, that is in the shared life. Then we have the concern of God, how fast we build the church and the quality of the work that is reproduced. Then we have the church, which is a business or an organization, and in the shared life is the body, there is the organization. Some reasons why church planting or projects fail is that one, or A, what we'll ask ourselves a question in A, what was lacking? Number one, a lack of a clear direction and wisdom from God in the planning stages. What lacks that the church was not continuing or that the church fails is because there was a lack of a clear direction and wisdom from God in the planning stage. When people were planning on how to do the church planting, they did not involve God. They just sat down and planned and executed without involvement of God. Then there was a lack of appropriate ministry gifts within the team. The team planted or planned to go and begin a uh, or start a church or plant a church, and then there were no gifts of that church, no gifts that were given or concerned. This is the problem that is happening today in the churches whereby we just want to grow faster. Maybe somebody wants to be called a, a bishop, and because a bishop has to be someone or an overseer of many churches, he go planting churches anyhow and sending people anyhow without proper preparation, without proper giftings, without identification of the gifts. You know, in the church, there is an evangelist. An evangelist is someone who goes on a mission, is someone who goes out to preach, and then we have a pastor. A pastor is the administrator, and if like a pastoral in the church, then the church will become an evangelistic church, an evangelistic mission where they just go out and they know mature people. If the church is a miracle thing, a miracle working organization, then you find that everybody wants to be a best to receive the, the organization and then they are not grounded in the work. If the church lacks a teacher, there is a problem of maturity. And therefore, we need, before you go out, there has to be an appropriate gift. You need to look at the appropriate gift. Then there's a lack of prayer, even more essential in pioneer work. You find that people are planning to go out for missions, but they don't involve in prayer. There is a lack of resources, people and finances. Resources are people, and the resources also comes in terms of finances. That is the facilitation. So you find that you go and plant a church, but there are no people, there are no finances. Then there is also a lack of character and maturity in the leaders. You send people who are not mature. You send people who does not reproduce Christ in them. People who lack character. When people, when when they go and proclaim or preach the gospel and people see them, then they distaste the gospel simply because of the people who are there. Then there is a lack of training. You send people who are not trained, people who are not well equipped. They go and they begin churches because according to them, they think the church is a place where we go and get money because of the offerings. But then we lack, when they lack proper training, then when trials and temptations come, they will see that it does not add up. 
then there is a lack of strategy and administration. This calls for vision and planning. Remember in the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2, he was told to go up on a, on a tower and when he receives any gift, he has to write it down so that someone may run with it. This calls for a planning, a vision and a planning. So a lack of a strategy and administration also makes the church planting to fail. Then there's a lack of unity within the team. When you have a team that are not coordinating together, a team that are not networking, a team that does not agree with one another, the Bible says that two cannot work together unless they agree. Then there's a lack of understanding of the target culture. You are going to a particular group of people, you want to go and evangelize to them, but you, you fail to understand their culture. You fail to understand what they value. You fail to understand what they believe in. So that when you go there, you take them from the known to the unknown. But now you want to go there with the gospel. You want to go and talk and talk against their, their culture and you expect the gospel to penetrate. So there is a lack of understanding of the target culture. Then a lack of willingness to adapt to the new culture. You find that Christians go to a particular group of people where they, have, they, are, they, they want to go and evangelize and they find that the people have their culture. You, in order for you to penetrate quickly, you need to get there, look at the positive aspects in their culture, embrace it, assimilate yourself into it, then introduce the gospel. So this is what we call contextualization, which is the necessary adjustments in form that allow God's message to survive between cultures and time. Now we have our discussion point, which is a takeaway home, that you discuss your experience in church planting efforts or those that you have seen planted. Were any of the problems listed above a problem in the church planting effort where whatever we have talked up there, are there the problems as to why many churches have begun and it has failed to take off? Yes, it's because it is true that such or those points that have been highlighted there have been missing. Then part four, let's look at foundational scripture and concepts for church planting. Scriptures for church planting. Proverbs 24 verse 10. Proverbs 24 verse 10. The Bible says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. So when you begin a church and you, you find that it is not working and then you faint in the midst, then the Bible says that your strength is small. When you come through adversity, that is not a time to faint. It is not a time to give up. It is a time to move even further. It is a time to stand firm to the work that has been given you. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10. Zechariah 4, 10. For who has despised the days of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plumet in the hands of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. So here is you are being admonished not to despise the days of a small beginnings, because it is in those baby steps that God will work on you. God will make his way through. And that small beginning will one day become great. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 
we are not to be wary in whatever we do, whatever small it may be, that is a small beginning, but with baby steps, you will eventually get there. Let's look at the concept to meditate on and to discuss. Pray like everything depends on God. Work like everything depends on the team. So every time we are doing the work of God, pray like everything depends on God and work like everything depends on the team. As much as we put ourselves forth to the work of God, let us put forth God. Let him be with us. Let him begin with us. Pray like everything depends on him. Pray like there is nothing that you have. You are just a person. You know nothing. You have nothing. You can't go anywhere. It is his work. It is the work of God. Don't carry it on your shoulder. Let God take control. Then work like everything depends on the team. This means that there has to be teamwork. You need to partner. You don't need to work alone. You need to be net to network with others. You need to have a strong team to back you up. Then consistently review and remember what God has already done. This will help you to have faith for victorious for victories in the future. Every time somebody says, John Maxwell said that whatever gets rewarded, it gets done. So in every small thing that you've done, sit down and appreciate and thank God for every little effort that has been done. Then let's look at six phases of church planting, which was given out by Glenn Yoda. Number one, or A, or principle number one, or phase, phase one, conception. This is the beginning. It is the space of church planting that happens before you leave for the target area. This is when you sit down and plan, where you sit down and you propagate, you sit down and you, 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 you first of all, before you go for execution, you sit down in a place and then you plan on how you are going to do that work. In this space, the vision and strategy are conceived and developed. The team spends much time together and begins to form strong relationship. That is phase one, conception of church planting. Phase two of church planting is prenatal. This phase happens before the church is a public place of worship. It happens before the church is. Prenatal is when you sit down before you go there. Before you go and plant that church, there is a team that is going to take care of the church. This team, you do a lot, you do a lot of team building in order for them to build small, strong relationships. The church planting team makes constant contacts in the community. They conduct personal and public evangelism. They go door to door. They go and introduce themselves. They can also go and introduce themselves to the churches around. They can go and look for the man of peace. There is a man of peace. A man of peace is someone who welcomes you in a particular area. You identify a man of peace and you go there and you make a relationship. The first disciples are formed into small groups. There may be several small groups meeting in various houses. Ministerial foundations are formed. Basic doctrine is taught. Before the church goes out, you teach them the basic doctrine in which they are going to teach themselves. Then phase number three is now the bath. The church begins to be a public place of worship where possible. In restricted cultures, wisdom and boldness must be considered. Where there are restricted cultures, you go there with your team, you identify the culture of those people, and then you see on how you are going to penetrate with the gospel. And all this happens now during the bath. It's a philosophy and method of worship is implemented. People in the community are invited to attend public meetings on Sunday. Phase number four, early life of the church. The converts with the strongest commitment to Jesus begin to take more and more responsibility for the decisions and activities of the church. This is now where people are being encouraged to work, not to just come and be blessed, but to do the work. Those who have strong commitments, they are given work and they work. Delegations of authority begins. Reproduction of leaders and gifts 
begin. Then phase number five, adolescence until maturity. We are talking about the church. A sense of permanence and maturity is developed. The focus is on leadership training. Here is when you train the leaders, the ones that you will give the mantle, the ones that will run with the vision, the ones that will continue with this work of the gospel. There is a clear process of the multiplication of leadership and the ministry. There is increasingly evident organization in the body of believers. Here is where you take your time to develop a team to give them what it, is, what it takes for the gospel to move forward. Phase number six, reproduction. The church begins to reproduce itself, planting other churches and ministering to its host community. The evangelism and missions begin to be emphasized. The church sends missionaries to start new churches. So those are the six principles of taking the gospel or of planting the church. We said the first phase is conception, then prenatal, and then we move on to the birth, then the early life, adolescence, until maturity, and then reproduction reproduction you reproduce the church reproduces itself and that is how the church throughout the ages has been spreading and spreading and spreading so this is In order to emphasize what we have said in the six phases, we have said that there is the conception, which is the, the, the baby step, the first step. The conception in the, in the conception in, in the conception stage is where there is the formation of the team and developing the vision. In this phase, there is the evangelism or training or practice. There is staff management training, team relationships are built, prayer results in direction. Then we go to the second phase, which is prenatal. In the prenatal, we have the ministerial foundations, organize, organizing small groups, entering the community, then planning the strategies. Here is using church growth principles, training in small groups, then community services or in the community services, you can look at their health. If there are sick people around, you can organize medical camps, or you come with food where people come and eat, or you invite them for a lunch or, or a lunch or a supper or a drink. Then this moves us to the third group, to the third phase, which is birth. And in birth is where you begin public meetings, which is the but you can also begin the ministry for the children. So here, there is praise and worship and baptism and Lord's Supper that is being done now during at birth where the church has already been brought forward. Then we have the early life of the church and the early life of the church is where the, ministry, the members agree on covenant they, you train small group leaders, emphasize on evangelism. This is where we, we train them. We train small group leaders, training in evangelism. Then the adolescence until maturity is whereby you are forming new ministries, multiplication of leaders, and then you get a permanent location. Then you delegate authority, you delegate responsibility, and then there you go for the production where you begin church planting and emphasis is on missions. And missionary training and management training is being done in that phase, in that last phase. Let's look at the author's comment. The following is a list of methods to attract additional people to 
the church. This list only represents suggestions and is not a complete list of possibilities. Create your own list of methods based on the trainings of your situation. So whatever we will learn here and whatever is being given is not all that it is. You also you can also come up with other strategies or of course also depending on where you come from in whichever parts of the world you are from. So number one, pray to the Lord of the harvest, Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. Practice hospitality. Invite people to your home. Have a neighborhood picnic. So the church begins even at a home where you meet at the home and you invite people for a supper or a dinner and then you can also plan for picnics. Offer home Bible studies on special topics of interest that will be especially relevant to that group of people such as marriage, raising children, financial successes, etc., etc. Come up with a topic and try or use that topic as a conduit to reach the people. Organize special events for children, then advertising in the radio, in television, in posters, flyers, etc. Just do an advert. Give personal invitations to the Sunday morning service or to special meetings. Do personal evangelism. Testify to those you meet in natural situations. When you meet people, you testify. Do door to door evangelism. Do street evangelism. That is in the parks, in the street corners. Make tents, have ten meetings. Do follow up. Send a letter and visit those who visit the church for the first time. You visit them. That is the follow up that you are supposed to do. Let's look at apostolic teams and the philosophy of philosophy of go, live, go, give, live. Apostolic team. An apostolic team is formed based on the five ministries found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, in that we have apostles, those who are sent to organize new works. An apostle means sent ones. So the ones who are sent to go and organize new works. Not to be confused with the original 12 apostles in the New Testament. Prophets, those who, whose messages call the people of God back to the core principles they proclaim. So the prophets, their work is to call the people who are already in Christ and they have perverted their ways. They have perverted the way of God. So the, the work of the prophets is to let them to come back, to go back to the principles. Evangelists are those with a unique call to build the church. Pastors are those with a unique call ability to nurture disciples into all aspects of the Christian life and the church. Teachers are those with an ability to fortify believers with practical wisdom for Christian living and service. Each of these ministries must do its part to establish the church. This means that apostles and prophets focus on planting the foundations and giving direction. Evangelists focus on evangelism or mission. Pastors focus on pastoral ministries, that is the healing process of the people. Teachers focus on teaching or maturing or growing the people of God, giving them basics and foundations. This is not to say that teachers are not able to evangelize or that pastors are not able to teach ETC. We are only speaking here in terms of emphasis and focus. Certain types of growth of the church will result in the focus being on certain ministries. So there is a there is a, a church to focus on or to discuss. We look in one end, there's the types of growth, and the other end is specialist. So in the types of growth, the initial growth, specialists for the initial growth of the church are the apostles, prophets, and evangelists. Then internal growth or quality is more on pastoral or pastors and teachers who does the internal growth. Then the expansion growth or quantity, that is the filling of the church, is the work of evangelists. 
the specialists are evangelists. In extension, growth, or forming new sister churches, these are the works of evangelists, teachers, and apostles. So when the church is not growing, it is not the pastor to be, to be who is supposed to be pinpointed. It is the work of the evangelist who go out, they evangelize, and they fill the church. The bright, bright the bridge, bridge growth or the missions for the apostles and prophets. The vision growth in general, specialists are prophets. After the church has been planted, each of the individual ministries should begin to concentrate on training and reproduction. Evangelists train other evangelists to be evangelists. Pastors train others to be pastors. ETC. The idea is to produce your gifts. The goal is to work yourself out of a job so that others can do the ministry. So somebody say that the moment you, the legacy that you will leave on this earth is what will you, what will happen many years after you have left this world. Will your work still continue or will you go with what you are doing? After there is a sense that the gifts have been reproduced, the team lives in order to do the same thing in an, another unreached location. The planted church is taught to send their own apostolic team to another unreached location. The same process of the reproduction of gifts should happen within the church, and the result should be that several apostolic teams could be sent out. This is the beginning of the natural multiplication of churches. Discussion. How are these apostolic teams different than traditional church planting teams? Why are apostolic teams generally more successful? The, let's look at the, uh, the second phase of the philosophy of go, give, live. The apostolic team must have a philosophy of ministry. We can call this philosophy go, give, and live, which is the philosophy of ministry. Go, Matthew 28, verse 19, and Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, you remember it is the calling that God told called Abraham, and he told him, go out of the, your people to a place that I will show you. And Jesus gave out the same commandment to his disciples when he told them, go ye to all the world. So missionaries must go in obedience to Christ's command. Missionaries must leave their own homes and go to the nations of the world. Then we have give, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, and Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, we heard Paul telling Timothy that whatever he had had him doing to do the same to faithful men, to give it to faithful and committed men, so missionaries must give freely what they have received freely. The greatest mission story is in John chapter 3 verse 16 where God came, Jesus went. Then we have the third apostolic mission which is live. John 16 verse 7, 2 Timothy 2, 2 verse 2, Acts chapter 14 verse 23, and Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, Acts chapter 20 verse 32, and Acts chapter 20 verse 29 and 30. Missionaries must also live. Jesus left so that the Holy Spirit will complete the work. Paul left for the same reason. He knew that the natural process was for the Holy Spirit to mature the church. Living is a necessary part of the idea of reproduction. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. How Now I have a question. How comes that many people don't live? They want to stay until they are dead in the church, you are supposed to mature the ministry. After the ministry or the body has grown, you leave, you go to other places, you go and begin another one, then you mature people and you leave. And we are seeing this work happening to Paul. That is what he was doing. He was going to a place and he says, separate son to me Barnabas, so that I may teach them the work. He goes to a place and he mentors Timothy. He go to a place. That is all that he was doing. There is risk involved. 
Acts chapter 20 verse 29 and 30. That is why we have faith. To let go is to let grow. Live is an essential part of missions. Acts chapter 20 verse 29. Acts 20, verse 29 and 30. For I know this, let after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. For there is the risk of living, the moment you live, you live. There are certain things that may come, but are you afraid to live just because of what people may say? Live is often the most difficult part of the proposed philosophy. It is also the most violated. Many missionaries never leave the place they go to. Why? It happens when missionaries are trying to build their own kingdoms. Many people are just building their own mean they have been sent out for missions but when they get there they want to build their own kingdoms it happens when missionaries have a low opinion or prejudice of the abilities of the nationals they feel that they cannot do the work correctly this is insecurity where you find that people think that other people cannot do the work it is only them who can do it it happens when missionaries have a high opinion or pride of their own abilities no one else can do it as good as they can they think that it is only them who can do the work. It happens when missionaries have little faith. They choose to put more faith in themselves and therefore establish a system of control to have a sense of security. This is where people come out with titles and they don't want any other person to be equal to them. That's why you find that in ministries. It's only few ministries, by the way, where you can find there are many bishops. There are many people who have been elevated to the to the same rank with the with the visionary with, with the visionary with the with the overseer general overseer where you find that the general overseer is a bishop and he has an, a, he has anointed another person to be a bishop in the same ministry. Here, what happens is that people recognize that this is the overseer, this is the founder, this is the father, but they know. When it comes to work, when they say that it is bishops who are supposed to go and do this, they all go, but they have a rank, they have, they have a boundary where they know and they recognize based on relationship. But insecure leaders will never reproduce people of his character. They will never reproduce people of their character. They, these guys, these insecure people will always quote the verse whereby in order for you to succeed, you must see me going. You must see me be taken. And they take the teachings of the they, they, they want they go to the Bible and they look at uh, and they, they want us to to see what happens during the days of Elisha and the day that they see they say when you see me taken, you will receive double anointing. That is insecurity. It happens when they have they have little faith on others and therefore they bring a system of control because of a sense of security. It happens when missionaries are lazy. They become comfortable in the missionary lifestyle. It happens when missionaries do not keep the goal in their minds towards which missions is working. Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. Jesus said that and it will not come to an end until this message is preached to all the gospel. Romans 15 verse 20 and 21. It happens when missionaries try to build institutions and programs instead of the kingdoms of God. When people sit down and they want to build now institutions, they concentrate on how they will build a school, on how they will build this and that, instead of how they will grow the kingdom. Thus, they have become involved in many time-consuming projects that often have no lasting values or they have no eternal value. It happens when missionaries think that going slowly means we are producing higher quality fruits. 
There is a high value put on the sacrifice of being in the same place for 20 years. Paul will not have agreed. He will say that intensity means quality. Acts chapter 20 verse 31. Acts 20 verse 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the, by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. It happens when missionaries do not understand the principles of natural growth. Churches grow naturally when they are given freedom to grow naturally. They do not grow naturally when they are controlled and spoon-fed. Churches that are dependent on missionaries are not healthy churches. The churches that depend on missionaries, the churches that depend to be given things, the churches that depend that when you go to that church, you are supposed to give and when you are being prayed for, you are supposed to you are supposed to give fruits worthy of that prayer. Those churches do not grow. They are dependent churches. It happens when missionaries speak of teaching men how to fish so they can fish for themselves instead of fishing for them. Unfortunately, many do not practice that principle of teaching them a hook, giving them, teaching them how to receive. What have your experiences been regarding the go, give, live principles of missions? Discuss and allow comments. Now let's look at the leave. The leave part of missions is often the most difficult because the missionaries must give away what they have worked so hard to start. In this sense, the leave phase is really only a second part of the give phase. Missionaries must give in order to give away. The leave part of missionaries is often the most important because it is the part that allows the young church to grow naturally. Go and give allow the church to be born naturally. Live allows the church to grow naturally. Remember, Paul and his team went in order to live. They did not go in order to stay. They multiplied the kingdom of God by multiplying ministry. They started the ministry then, as soon as possible, they gave the ministry to those who lived there, there who could actually do it better because they could do it more naturally. They lived there. They were the natural leaders and knew their people and their culture. So when you go and plant a church, and there are people who have come there, and they are matured up, and you live to them, and then you go to another place and you begin, you find that those leaders will be more effective because they are in the ground and they understand the concept of leading those people. The apostolic team must leave as soon as possible without leaving too quickly before the foundations are set for two reasons. To let the church grow naturally under the local leadership, the church must be indigenous. To continue the apostolic work, the team must leave to plant churches in other and rich areas. Paul was able to have this philosophy because he trusted the Holy Spirit. He put his faith in God completely to complete the work. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 where he said that he who started the good work in me is faithful and just to complete it. There is a, a diagram here. The following diagram helps explain the ministry of apostolic teams and the philosophy of ministry called Go, Give, Live. The key is reproduction. Discuss this concept and answer any questions. So there is the team here, team A. Team A goes to an unreached people or group. Number one, presence, proclamation, persuasion, power, programming, five Ps. Then this leads to planted church, phase one, with an equipped fivefold ministry. Team, apostolic team A, original team, goes to another place. Then apostolic team B, sent from planted churches, phase one. So in this part, the team A, which is the apostolic team, which goes to another place, they go to a big people and a group, and they work with the five Ps 
where there is the, where their presence, the proclamation, persuasion, power, propagation, the five peace that we have said. The planted church also continues with the work they, assist, they, they reproduce a sister church. And the apostolic team B, they go to unreached people or group, which is phase three, and they also use the five Ps. Then the church, the, the apostolic team B, they plant a church, and the planted churches also uses the fivefold ministry in order to expand to the left and to the right, and they reproduce sister churches, and the sister churches reproduce themselves again. Then we have said that they are rich people in the original apostolic team A, which has which goes to enrich people or group, and they use the five Ps, the presence, the proclamation, persuasion, power, and propagation. They plant a church, and the planted church, they based on the fivefold ministry, they come up with a sister church. We have seen also that this apostolic team A or the original team goes to another place or to enrich people and group based on the five Ps again. The presence, proclamation, persuasion, power, and propagation. And here, they plant a church. And the planted church goes to the left and to the right where they have team C. And the teams are sent from team C. There is the sent from and the sent. They, they, yeah, they sent from the main church and then they go to have sister churches. And this brings about the expansion of the church. Let's look at the 12 objectives of church planting. And we'll begin with the author's comment. The following 12 activities are derived from a church planting guide by George Patterson, used by permission of God. Activity 1 Seek the Lord's guidance. Getting started. Prayer is the most important activity in church planting. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, where the Bible says that blessed is the. Uh, Let's get there, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, and get the exact content and the context of what the Bible says about Proverbs chapter 3, where it talks of not leaning on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and live not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Jesus prayed before he went to new places. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 to 39. Peter was, give, was praying when God showed him his plans. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. God met him in the prayer, uh, in the prayer mountain. In this activity, we will one, pray in order to decide where to plant a new church. Two, make plans for the natural multiplications of churches. Where do I plant the church? That's the first question you ask yourself. Pray and ask God for a vision and a burden for a specific place. Meet with other leaders who might be interested in church planting. Ask God to, inform, to form a team. That is, pray together regularly, accept the advice of others, strive for unity in the group. God can bless unity. Psalms 133, verse 1 to 3, where the Bible says that when brethren gathers together, the Bible says that God commands a blessing there in that unity. If possible, Visit the area that is being considered. Any area that you have earmarked, you visit that area if possible. Visit, you visit that area. Questions to consider. Jeez. Questions to consider. How far away is the location where you want to go and plant a church? How far is that location? Is it already being evangelized? 
how many Christians are there? How receptive, how receptive to the gospel are the people who live there? Are the churches there actively witnessing and evangelizing? Do friends or relatives of other Christians live there? Will they go with us to visit? Are new people moving into the area? What type of work do the people do? What type of problems do the people have? What is their economic situation? Are they poor? What do, they, what do these people do for enjoyment? Are there different groups of people who live in that same area? How can I plan for the multiplication of churches? Draw a simple map of the area you have chosen. Decide on a strategic location to plant the first church. Decide on several other strategic places where churches should be planted. Consider how the initial church could begin a chain of churches. Commit to the philosophy of training local leaders to do ministry. Plan to train local leaders who will go to plant churches in other areas. So consider the variabilities the, variability, the variable, variables of geography, culture, and receptivity. Plan for the churches that are close to the target area geographically and culturally to plan the church in that area. So you plan the church that is in that area so that you don't take the church too close to another church. Don't step to the next church. You just plan on how you are going to schedule this church. As answer the following questions regarding the situation seen on the map and the information provided below the map. Where would you plant the first church? Each letter represents a location that needs a church. Into which areas would you send trained workers from the original church? How would you plan to reach all of the areas? The team should make a covenant together. The team that you've already planted here. And even as you plant these churches, you will try to see the, the, the area with similar color cultures. That is, you, you, you group them with culturally similar and those that are different, you regroup them. Pray and fast. Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. Then enlist others to pray for the team. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1. You put a team that will be prayer, prayer partners with this team that is planning to go. Part B, activity 2, organize your team. Introduction to organizing your team. The New Testament pattern is to plant churches in teams. Peter went with others to evangelize in Caesarea, Acts chapter 10, verse 23. Paul and Barnabas, also Mark, Luke, and others formed a team, Acts chapter 13, verse 2. In this activity, we will form a team, meet together to plan, forming the team. Pray for a church planting team. Jesus prayed all night before he chose his team. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. Establish a strategy to ensure strong commitment to the task. The best way to do this is to promote a strong commitment to Jesus and to other members of the team. This is accomplished through forming strong relationships. Then this leads us to the planning. Questions to ask in the meetings. Who will the team be accounted to? How will this accountability be made practical? What finances will the team need? How will the team get them? How will the leadership of the planted church be formed? Things to do in the meetings. Pray, decide to, and review the philosophy and strategy of church planning that will be used. Study maps while discussing strategy. Find ways to obtain literature in the language of the target group. Discuss the practical details concerning the daily life of the team that is the housing, the food, family time, work schedules. This is very key, very important. As you plan, you are planning for the church, discuss with the missionaries who will go there. How will they have their family time? It is not a full time thing where 
you go and to forget your family. Remember, we come from families. There is a place we come from. How will that work? How will they schedule their work? If there are those who are working, they, are, they have had people who are telling people to leave their place of work simply because of what they are doing. And they are telling them, if your work is more important than the church, then you need to reschedule. I want to tell us that we need to work with work schedules because we need those people after coming out of missions, they need to fend for their families. They need, they have families to take care. So you need also to plan for the food and the housing. As those missionaries will go to those places, how will they be, they be housed? Where will they stay during those periods? Consider the gifts of each team member. Assign responsibilities according to these gifts. People are gifted differently. Look at the areas of their giftings and assign responsibilities appropriately. The final meeting should be a commissioning service for the team. Acts chapter 13 verse 1 to 3 and chapter 15 verse 40. It has to be a commissioning, a commissioning meeting. A report can be given to the larger body of Christ who is supporting the mission. Team members can reaffirm their commitment to the mission and to each other. The sending church can pray over and lay hands on the team. How does the activity described above relate to your culture and environment? That is food for thought. It's a takeaway home. It is for you for discussion. Activity number three, become organized with the people. Introduction to becoming acquainted with the people. Paul related to the people. For example, Paul observed the people and the surroundings of Athens. Then he spoke to the people in a way that related to them. Acts chapter 17, verse 16 to 35. Let's very quickly go to here. I'll read that verse where the Paul identified with the people. Acts 17. Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city only given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some say what will this babbler say other some other some he seems to be a settled forth of strange god because he preached unto them jesus and the resurrection and they took him and brought him unto Iropagus, saying may we know what this new doctrine wherefore you speak is for you being certain, you for you bring certain strange things to our ears. We will know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new things. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens. I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscriptions to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. God who made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, Neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things, and has made of all of one blood all nations of men for to dwell in all the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. They 
that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, on, of us, for in him we live and move and have our, our being. A certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offering, offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God with it. But now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. Wherefore, he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear you again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, how may certain men claim unto him and believed? Among the, win the which was Dionysius, the Arepogite, Arepo Arepo and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So we have seen here that Paul related to the people. He related to them when he was presenting the gospel. In this activity, we will decide who to evangelize first, become acquainted with the people. Who should we evangelize first? Some churches grow better when they are formed according to the same ethnic group and class. This is called the homogeneous unit principle of church growth. Focus on one well-defined group of people. You go to a place, you look to a particular group of people, and then you choose a leader from them. First, use any connections you might have. Visit family members or friends of those on the team or in the, in the, in the sending church. Evangelize in natural situations in the beginning. Visit neighbors. Talk to people in the market, park, and on buses. Participate in community activities. Start conversations with the people that can lead you to witnessing. The gospel spreads most naturally through networks of relationships. It may even be possible and beneficial to join organizations. Who are the community leaders? Who are the people who influence others? There are many strategic benefits to evangelizing the leaders first. They can provide many more connections and can provide a natural base of leadership in the church. So this one is where you demarcate an area, you go and look at people who are in that area. The leaders, the local leaders, go meet them, talk to them. They can be people who can give you connection. In general, be an observer and a learner. If it is done with the sensitivity, a questionnaire can be used to make contacts and to learn about the people. Team members could go door to door in that area where you have target, a target, a target group, getting acquainted with the people. It is very important that you know the people. You will be a better evangelist if you know the beliefs, the beliefs and needs of the people. Go to that area, know what they like, know what they eat, know their culture, know their costumes, and then after that, you can now form a basis out of it. The following questions should be considered. Use tact in gaining the necessary information. What is their religion? What religious customs do they practice? Why do they practice them? What do they believe about God? How do they worship Him? What do they know and believe about Jesus? What do they know and believe about Jesus? What do they believe about heaven and hell? What do they believe about eternity? And what do they believe about creation? What do they believe about evil spirits? What do they believe happens to them after death? What do they believe about sin and salvation? What do they know about the church? Is it positive? What do they think is negative about the church? What do they believe about prayer? 
What are the most common problems and needs of the people? What type of work do they do? What is their economic level? So th those are the questions that you need to ask yourself before you set forth to go and evangelize to that particular area. How does the activity described above relate to your culture and environment? Activity four, claim Christ to victory. Claim Christ victory. Introduction to claiming Christ's victory. Take time to study the following scriptures with your team. One, the Bible tells of many victories that were preceded by prayer and fasting. Study and discuss Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 20, especially focused on verse 12 and verse 13. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 13. Because the focus is on verse 12 and 13. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. The Bible says, This is a letter of Paul to the church of Ephesus. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness, weaknesses, wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. That is very key, but you can read the entire, the entire verses up to verse 20. In your own time, consider, study, and discuss Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, Corinthians, Colossians chapter 2 verse 15, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and 15, Romans chapter 1 verse 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 and 4, and Daniel chapter 9 verse 1 to 3. This activity should be done throughout the church planting process. However, here we want to focus on intense spiritual warfare in preparation for more intense evangelism. Number two, plan and have intense times of prayer and fasting. Pray for discernment. What are the particular spiritual strongholds that need to be broken in that area? Pray for the power of God to be manifested. Pray for souls to be saved. Proclaim the authority and victory of Jesus Christ over the spiritual powers in that area. Continue praying until you feel you have gained the victory. The victory of missions is not done in the mission field. It is proclaimed in the powerhouse, in the prayer house. It is proclaimed in the formative area, formative stage, when you are planning and then before the execution. How does uh, the activity described above relate to your culture and environment? How does it relate to your culture and, and environment? Activity number five, find receptive people. These are the ones I call or are called the uh, men of peace. Introduction to finding men of peace or receptive people. At this stage, we should try to make contact with as many people as possible. John chapter 1, verse 41 and 42. We should focus on the heads of households. When you go to a place, you don't go to children and women or wives. You may be taken wrongly. Go to the heads of family. We are like fishermen who cast out 
nets wide in order to catch the maximum number of fish. Then we draw in the net and catch those who are most interested. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 and Acts 17, verse 34. We are like farmers who sow the seed on all types of ground, but who concentrate on the soil that has the most potential. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3 to 7, and chapter 18, no, and verse 18 to 23. Do not spend a lot of time with those who are not interested or with those who show strong opposition. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. You don't go there and make debates on people who show strong opposition. Give priority to those who are more receptive. Paul, for example, went to the Gentiles because they were more receptive than the Jews. In this activity, we will try to make contact with people who are receptive to the gospel. Pray for divine appointments. The Holy Spirit can lead you to receptive people. Matthew 13, verse 3 to 7, and verse 18 to 23. Set a goal. How many people do you want to contact? How many will you have further contact with? Contact with? Consider and agree on effective and efficient methods of evangelism. How will you make the contacts? Make a plan. Review the information you have from activity three. This will help you to decide on which method. Put the plan in action. Do it. Do it. Or execute. Go for it. Evaluate your work. Did you reach your goals? What plans worked? What plans was changed? How do the people respond to the methods that is used? Is the principle of multiplication in order to contact more people? Use the principle of multiplication in order to contact more people. Go with those who have already shown interest to visit their families and friends. Use the social gospel, that is the mercy seeds, to work together with the evangelical gospels, the spiritual needs. Respond to physical and felt needs. What are the needs of these people? respond to it. One, do not allow social work to weaken the evangelistic work. Evangelize those who come for help. As you seek to attract new people, establish only those projects or ministries which the new church is able to sustain, especially if they address felt needs. Discussion. How does the activity described above relate to your culture, to your culture and environment? And this leads us to the close of today. We will end there and then we will come to the next class where we will come and look at activity six, where we will teach now the gospel. We will learn on the teach the gospel in that class. Thank you so much. May the Lord God bless you. Stay blessed uh, during your time. Go and discuss all those that we have learned today.